Hello, everybody. Um, well, lucky you. Another rainy day here in New York, so uh, I'm stuck inside, so I thought I'd paint something for you. Um, okay, today I want to do a development of a pencil drawing sketch I did about a year ago when I was teaching in Rome. Um, and I just, in thinking about it, thought it would be a really good uh, a uh, case study for developing a pencil sketch into a painting and also a number of topics I think would be helpful, hopefully, and useful to you to discuss while I'm doing it. So this sketch is a little more finished than I would normally do just as a, as a little compositional study. Uh, it was not even intended to be a painting. This was intended to be a finished drawing and it was, this is a, it's a photocopy of it. But again, I thought I could uh, transpose it into a full color painting and then point out some useful tips uh, for you all, or things that go through my mind that may prove to be useful to you or not, but hopefully they will. Um, where we are is Rome, as I say, but this is, um, on Capitoline Hill, this is the Campidoglio, the famous, uh, beautiful development, really, designed by Michelangelo, great artist who was also a great architect back in the 1500s. Um, it wasn't completed in his lifetime, but was completed in the 17th century, I believe, under... Um, another great architect, Della Porta, but it was after Michelangelo's original designs. Um, this is not looking into the piazza, it's looking out, really. It's a, a slightly more intimate view of the space. Oh, I have a reference photo. Here we go. So here we are looking out of the piazza at the beginning of uh, this grand, very sloped stairway that Michelangelo designed. Uh, it was um, actually called um, a coordinata, which is a very long sloped stairway with very uh, short rise for each step, very long treads. The intention was to create a grand, graceful entry to, to a space and also to allow for horses and carriages to be driven up here, which I guess in the old days they were. This uh, coordinata was flanked at the entry to the piazza on either side by these beautiful statues uh, of Castor and Pollux. Um, lots of mythology and stories there. But anyway, it's a very beautiful entry and I wanted to focus in part as a lesson, but just because it's what excites me of the somewhat, uh, the things that we tend to overlook. Rather than looking into the piazza, I wanted to look at walking out of the piazza, sort of turning my back on the actual subject, if you will, or the, the big show, and looking at other smaller compositions that we can find everywhere that we might otherwise tend to just walk by and ignore. I just love the composition of physical elements, the statues, but really the subject of this painting and the lesson for today is how to set up sort of a, a narrative, a dialogue between subject and space, or positive and negative shapes, if you will. So the subject of this painting really, as much as anything, is going to be the atmosphere. It's this beautiful sky, the trees, um, and again, negative shapes. And I thought also as a lesson, it'd be interesting to talk about uh, treatments of atmosphere, ways of painting trees, ways of painting clouds and skies, that sort of thing would be an interesting subject. But the most important takeaway for me and the thing that interested me, uh, because I talk a lot about your intention as an artist, what is, what is it you're trying to say? So my intention in doing the sketch and in doing the painting I want to do for you is that, the dialogue between the thing and that which is not the thing, between the negative shapes, the positive shapes, between the man-made objects and the natural world beyond. That's sort of, 
um, dialogue, that contrast, that conflict almost, is what always excites me. Rather than painting specific objects or things, I always think more about uh, the context in which you experience them, so that I try to paint my experience more than I try to paint whatever it is I may be looking at. I'm trying to paint what I see, and by that I mean what I feel, what I'm experiencing as I move through the world. So I just love this, uh, this sort of dialogue between, again, the positive and negative shapes, between the man-made and the atmospheric, between the static, the statuary, the buildings, and the, mo the mobility of the light, the changing of the light, and the mobility of the people that occupy this space. Um, other things we can discuss here, um, layering of subject matter to create um, hopefully a better sense of depth and three-dimensionality than you might get in a photograph. Photographs, I always counsel my students to be wary, not to not use them to paint, but to remember that a photograph has a way of flattening everything. The, the contrast in the objects that are very far away are as, are as etched and as bright and dark as the contrast in the areas that are close to you as a viewer. So I think it's incumbent on us as artists, painters, to, to accept that and to manipulate it if we want, to uh, lighten the distant objects up to make them feel further away and treat the objects that are closer to us in a different way. There's not a cookie cutter or one size fits all answer to that. It's just one of the questions I think we should ask ourselves when we start a painting. Do we want to emphasize that sense of depth and dimension? I almost always do. And so therefore, in the medium of watercolor is so ideal for those to try to answer those questions because you can pretty easily manipulate saturation, value, the chroma of the color for objects that are far away, and especially in watercolor edges. You can give softer edges to something you wish to look far away, harder edges to something that you uh, want to appear closer to the viewer. Again, that's not always what you want to do or always the correct answer for every painting that you're doing, but I think it always is a question that needs to be asked when you set out to design your uh, composition and to design your, uh, your uh, experience. I like the composition of shapes in this quite a lot. It's not an unusual view, but it's a bit unexpected. It's not a focal view particularly, but I really liked a lot of what I saw going on. The dialogue of different kinds of elements, empty space, positive space, light, dark, warm colorations, cool tonalities, all of these things. My way into art, for me, can be for you too if you want it, but it's always this idea, this idea of contrast. Two things that are opposing each other in reality meeting on the surface of my paper to find some kind of resolution. So to resolve warm tones, cool tones, light tones, dark tones, light and dark, the vertical, the horizontal, the diagonal energies, all of these things are what rattle around in my mind when I'm setting about choosing a composition and designing what I hope will be a good painting. All right, um, again, I did a sketch of this, but it turned out to be a rather more finished drawing than just a sketch, but that's okay because it's useful. It started to tell me ways that I can soften what we see in the distance. And what we see in the distance is not uninteresting. It's a bit of a corner of the, uh, the great monumental building, uh, Vittorio Emanuel, uh, the great wedding cake typewriter, it's sometimes called at the end of the Corso uh, <coughs> there in Rome, um, built around 1900, I think 1910. It's a, a neoclassical masterpiece, um, a bit over the top to say the least. And it displaced a lot of what the original Roman Forum 
space it would have occupied. So it's a controversial building in many ways. It's objectively, it's objectively impressive and beautiful. We see just a glimpse of it here. I love it. Uh, I take on board the downsides of it, but it's just an undeniable presence in Rome. And the clashing of times is also interesting. The past and the present meeting here is another thing that kind of got me excited about wanting to do this as a painting. So here we have elements of the original design of the building from the 1500s, of the piazza, I mean, to the completion, completion of it in the 17, the 1800s, the Church of Santa Maria, I'm not sure the year, but around that time, and then uh, the slightly more modernist building there in the distance from the 1900s. So that's Rome, really, the clashing of the past, the present, and the future. It's one of the many reasons I find it a beautiful, compelling city. Um, so here, when I set out to compose my paintings, I think about all of those things, but then I try to get real about it by thinking about uh, a composition of shapes. So somewhat a um, classical rule of thirds composition here, a horizontal weight occupying about a third of the bottom, a vertical weight occupying about a third of the vertical space, somewhat an L-shaped composition with the darkest darks probably happening here. The trees in the midground, I think I'll probably make a bit lighter in the painting so that they don't too easily become part of this shape. And then uh, what I hope will be a compelling pattern of light leading us through from the light in the clouds, which I can edit out or change, but I love them and I want to include some of that to set up these connections. So the light in the sky, connected to the light of this beautiful white marble building in the background, connected to the white marble of these iconic statues in the foreground, right down into the piazza, and I'll create some light there too. And this way you take the viewer's eye on this journey. You connect, they don't have to physically touch, but I always think it important for me to establish this path of light through my paintings. Light, 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 light. So it's this serpentine path narrative that I'm creating. Of course, in watercolor, the light is just the weight of the paper shining through. The light is the one thing you don't paint, quite literally. You, can, you only paint the shades and the shadows. You paint the darks, the midtones and the darks, to give light its expression, to allow it to come alive. So if you're uh, designing or thinking about a path of light, you simultaneously, of course, have to think about a path of dark to frame that light and to make it uh, sing. Again, um, my darkest darks, I always sort of number them in my sketchbook, a three. Most of my darkest darks in the painting will happen here in this L-shaped um, figure. My lightest lights, I call them ones. And they'll pull you through along this um, path. The rest of the painting will be in various values of mid-tone, call it a two. The sky, largely mid-tone, some whites, some darker mid-tones, but pretty mid-value overall. This beautiful background building, I'm going to fade it out a bit from the photograph, not have anything as dark there as shows in the photo, to get it to look a bit mysterious and looming over the whole, uh, the whole scene. But all in mid-tones, so twos, twos, twos. And when I talk about these values, even a one, a light doesn't have to be pure unpainted paper, but it has to be within a, a, a range of your latest light values. Uh, twos, similar, there'll be a range of midtones and even darks. They're not all jet black. They will range from pretty dark to less dark, 
with coloration and luminosity, I hope, reading through. So overall, I'm pretty happy with the composition of shapes. This is a somewhat rare photo, for me at least, in that I like the general composition. I always think it's my job to take what I look at, interpret it, redesign it into something I see. And I did make changes, you'll see, but um, not that many in terms of location of, of shapes and the values that I see popping out. I redesigned the uh, design of the figures. Here we have a typical scene throughout Italy is a, a big tour group, a bunch of people walking together. You know, nothing wrong with that, but I thought a more lyrical treatment would be fewer people spaced out throughout the piazza at different levels coming up and down this these st beautiful stairway. And then um, designed not to mimic the photo, but designed to enhance my painting. So this was my starting point. I did this drawing earlier. It's not, again, much of a sketch. It's really a pretty finished drawing because I want this to be a fairly nice painting. Overall, relatively simple, but, and small, I'm working on 140 pound arches paper, rough surface, a quarter sheet. So size-wise, it's about 15 by 12. Um, this came out of a pad, so I think it's 16 by 12 is the overall size. Not tiny, but not a, not a large painting. And I did, again, a fairly nice drawing. I wanted this to have a, a certain amount of clarity and classical integrity and not look too much just like a loose freehand sketch. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I love doing that kind of thing, but I wished this painting to have just a hint more uh, formality than that. I sketched this up. Uh, I did use a straight edge to locate some of the major lines and then I freehand it over or near them. If you really need to do that, I think it's okay. It's also perfectly okay not to. Again, I wanted a little bit of this other contrast in this painting, which was the really almost formal rationality of the architectural elements with some crisper, cleaner, clearer edges and lines and details, and then the very loose, washy character of the sky, the landscape, and also the fluidity of the people, and as I say, the light. So that's why I felt in this case, some hard edges, some more crisp architectural details would be another level of contrast with the fluidity of the natural elements. Um, yeah, it's an aesthetic choice. It's not the right way to go or the wrong way to go, and it's not right for me always. It just depends on the kind of painting I want to do. Um, I think in the bigger context, I'm always talking about that with my students, so they ask, naturally, people ask, is it okay to use straight edges in your Line drawings, for example, and just as an example of a question I often get, is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? What should I use to do this or that? And sadly, the answer is almost, there is no answer. There's no right answer. It is, it depends. What is the story you're trying to tell? What is the effect you're trying to get across? Um, it depends. I start out with an intention, which I hope I've described this, this whole layering and series of contrasts, both um, physical and kind of emotional contrasts. I work from that point, radiating out from that point, I work backwards then to decide the coloration, the type of drawing, everything else, all the technical questions, sp answers of the technical questions spring from what kind of a story am I trying to tell in my painting? And that will answer for me, do I need to use this? Do I need to use that? Should I do this? Should I do that? All of it comes from that first initial question. What's the intent of this painting? Um, that is a whole other lesson, deciding what your intent should be. It isn't always the same, nor should it be, 
but uh, yeah, that's another lesson probably. I think those answers become much easier to answer for yourself the more you paint, the more you develop your own uh, particular unique point of view, which I do think we all have. It's just uh, this whole quest for the right way to do this, the wrong way to do that. I think it's understandable that we ask ourselves those questions, but they're often not healthy or useful questions to ask. It assumes we compare ourselves to others and to others who ask similar questions. And, you know, I understand when we're just starting out painting and trying to just figure out how to move paint around a page, we don't necessarily have to get all philosophical about our point of view and uh, developing a unique style. That's not a burning question necessarily for all of us. Um, it was for me, but um, it did come later, you know, after I figured out that I had at least a modicum of uh, expertise in basic painting. However, I just think those questions are always there. They're lurking, waiting for us to uh, start developing answers to. And you can learn much quicker if you just allow yourself to stop uh, always looking for the right answer and, and instead look for the answer that works for you. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm hesitating talking too much about that, but it's a, it's a very, very big, deal. I think we can work really hard, but we can waste a lot of time and not work very smart when we're not asking ourselves the right question, when we're not confident enough in our desire to paint or to do anything, really. But, um, all right, it is a bit overdrawn. It's a bit darker than I would normally draw, but I just wanted it to show on camera. But also, it does sort of fit the the whole vibe of the painting I want to do, which is also a little bit of contrast of sort of classical architecture and classical drawing with looser, uh, more fluid watercolor expression. If it works, it's going to be great. If it doesn't, oh well. Those are another painting down the road. That's another thing I do think we do to ourselves. We're, we're very we fall victim to being afraid of making a mistake, either in the big picture or the small. And um, we forget that if painting is just fun and it's, especially in watercolor, it's all mistakes. So, and you know, so what if we screw up or make a mistake? Life goes on, we'll do another. Um, I'm gonna do the sky first. I'll talk a little while I'm doing it about various ways to paint skies. Again, like everything else, there's no one right way. Uh, even for me, I have many different ways of painting skies. It depends on the subject. Again, another cul-de-sac. I don't want to say that just because this guy appears in the photograph, I need to copy it. I don't mean that, but I do like this guy. I think this, this sort of a beautiful, compelling cloud shapes that fall just behind the building really play into the narrative that I want to tell, the contrast between atmosphere, nature, and the human-made elements, the, the rationality of the architecture, and the irrationality of, uh, of the atmosphere. I love that. I also like the blue in this case. I think it'll, it'll uh, set up a narrative of cool in the atmosphere, Trees and sky will be largely in cool tones. Warm tones will be reserved largely for the, uh, the architectural um, human-made elements. It's another thing you can think about. So I'm not gonna mimic the sky, but I am taking a lot of cues from it because I think it was unusually um, appropriate to what I wanted to paint. I always love to, well, I don't necessarily love to, but I almost always, design my own skies. What I photograph is rarely what will work best in my painting. 
but in this rare case, I think it actually does work. So I'm going to just do um, a sort of demonstration on how I often paint skies. As I said earlier, the only white we have for the most part in watercolor, we don't paint it, we reveal it. So if you want to reveal the light in the sky, don't paint it. So what I'm doing is washing over with just clear water, no pigment at all, just clear water in the area where I want to save light as a cloud shape. Then I'm going to take a light blue, which is, um, I'm using fairly clear manganese blue, not terribly dark. And then on the dry paper, I'm just bumping it into the area of wet that I just painted. So with a, with a mid-sized mop brush, these are one of my Neef brushes. Um, they hold a lot of water. It can be generally good for doing skies. So anyway, when you do this, you end up with, again, you're painting on the dry paper, but bumping this wet, sloppy wash very casually up into the area that you painted out with clear water so that you end up with some of these found or hard edges and then some of these lost edges where it touches the uh, where it touches the uh, wet area that you painted. That is a very quick way of establishing a cloud and generally speaking, I won't say it's fail safe, but it's fairly hard to go wrong. It's hard, it's easy to go wrong if you try to control it too much and you try to be very specific about your cloud shapes. I think if you keep the idea in mind that you just want to be approximate, general, uh, you'll be better off. Then, while it starts to set up, before it dries, you can clean up or darken up little edges. I'm going in now with some cobalt blue, so slightly darker, more intense blue. I'm hitting it here around some of the dark edges. I'm cleaning up little edges I don't like too much. I'm emphasizing certain areas I want to play up. And it's not too late while it's wet to play down others that you're not in love with. But you got to work pretty fast because if this sets up, you'll end up with streaks and lines that you probably aren't going to want. For those of you who haven't seen me paint, uh, yeah, I move the paint board. My, I have my painting taped down to a piece of gator board. Um, and I move it around a lot. And that is just to make things easier to reach, but also to play with gravity. Because it's such a fluid medium, of course. Watercolor, um, you get this pigment watercolor washes like this and obviously water runs downhill I learned that so you as the artist are in a lot more control than you might think you are about the way the paint runs on your page if you tilt it up it will run faster if you tilt it to the left it'll run that way or to the right um, if you lay it down flat it will run more slowly so you have a lot of control. Uh, you can avoid a lot of streaks and blossoms and those ugly things we tend not to like always, although they can be beautiful. But if you're trying to avoid them, they're fairly easy to avoid. As the sky reaches down more toward the horizon, I'm adding a bit more pigment into this wash and making it a little darker. I'm painting around the statues the horses and the figures of Castor and Pollock, or Castor in this case. Um, no, I didn't mask them out. I could have done, but 
I didn't. I don't find it too hard to just do negative shape painting. I dropped a little bit of pigment in the sky here. You can see it's starting to blossom a little. Not tragic, but I don't like it, so if I hit it with a mist bottle, tilt the board you in the direction you want the paint to run. Often those blossoms will just vanish or at least be much less annoying than they might have been. My little water mist bottle is a lifesaver, but it's also can be trouble. Just proceed with caution. A little bit is all you need they can literally wash the pigment right off the page. And uh, also, if you missed over anything here that you're trying to save out as light, like happened here, you're gonna kill the edge. And uh, again, not tragic, but not what you want, probably. Down here, I'm painting with the pointed end of this mid-size mop brush because it has a beautiful point. But as it gets down here, we're fading into the trees. And uh, I just want this to fade out. So I just pulled some paint out of the paintbrush, some clear water, paper towel. I'll just feather it out at the end. Here you've got a buildup of a bead of water. But if you pull the fluid out of the bristles. You just touch it and it siphons up what's left. And we're nearly done. Yeah, I don't tend to use masking ever. Um, there are cases, this is probably one of them, where it might actually help me to use it. But I I kind of like the challenge of holding a crisp, saved white edge. I like the, uh, the exercise of saving my lights, painting around, and a hand-struck edge, at least for the way I paint, tends to look better in my work than a masked out edge might, or at least that's what I tell myself. But uh, yeah, if this horse, for example, were masked out, I could just paint right over it. But I don't know. Then there's the time it takes to apply the masking and the time to peel it off. So I don't know. I think it all works out. Not so bad. Yeah, and I managed to salvage that sky and not end up with a blossom there, which again, wouldn't be the end of the world, but I just didn't want it. I wanted uh, a fairly smooth blue wash sky, with just interrupted with this explosion of uh, clouds just behind the building. I really tend, unless the sky is the focal point of my painting or the star of the show, if you want to call it that, I tend to play down my skies quite a bit because I always want them to look in the distance. I think a way to do that, of course, is to make them less dark, to make them less saturated, and to um, monitor the edges. Anything with a soft edge is going to look farther away. So here, again, I have sort of a series of harder edges and softer edges, but overall, the sky looks um, a little bit exciting, but it definitely looks to be in the background, I think. The actual day was very, very clear, and the sky, the clouds in the sky looked very etched. Here, the top of Castor's head got wet, so the blue ran into it, but it's still wet, so with the uh, paper towel, I'm able to <clears throat> clean that up. Not a big worry. 
Okay. Um, it's tempting at this stage to want to go in and mess around with the sky, but I think best to just leave it and try to be happy with it. It's okay. I think here there's a few too many aggressive edges, but I, I think in the long run, not bad at all. I think they'll be fine, he says, but then I'm really tempted to soften up part of this edge just in the back. So I've moistened the corner of a paper towel and softened up some of those edges. That's better. I think that's enough. It gets the sense of uh, that cloud. All right. Almost always I work my paintings up from darkest uh, from lightest lights to darkest darks. That isn't absolute, but it's almost always the case. The lightest light, of course, is going to be the light of the unpainted paper shining through. Um, so by that I mean, I, then I usually start with my lightest midtones and work them up through the darkest midtones then add my darkest darks, and that all reveals the light. This I want to save out as unpainted for the most part. The shade sides of these um, statue bases will have a little tonality, and of course a little tone on the statuary. But that I can do very near the end. It's always generally best, I think, to save most of your very lights, such as these, to uh, as long as you can. You can always get rid of light, but it's very difficult to um, regain it once it's gone. Uh, I don't think it's gonna be a problem if I save some of the pure white on the face of this building, even though it's in the distance. Some bit of logic tells me I could tone the whole building down and that'll make it uh, fade, but I don't think I want to. It's just a sliver I want the sun coming from the left side to the right. So in that case, this side of all these elements will be the lightest, a slight bit of shade on the right sides. Um, so this side of uh, the Victoria Emanuel Monument will be toned down, and there'll be some beautiful shadows here, which will help um, hopefully get this to fade back. If it doesn't work when the painting's very nearly done, I can pretty easily glaze over that with a light tone uh, to make it fade away, but I think uh, I think it's fine. I'm talking here, but sort of waiting to make sure the sky is settled, set enough that I can um, start adding some of that tone. Again, this is an unusually good reference photo. I, I really like a lot of the things that are happening, so I don't wanna, I can take a lot of cues from the reference photo, which is not always the case. So I wanna add a tone to the shade side. It's a very, very bright, sunny day in Rome, so even the shade sides of these elements are not very dark, they're fairly luminous. So I'm going to use a, a little bit of yellow ochre on the so-called shade side of this. This is a fairly cheap half-inch flat brush. Cheap, I say, because it's synthetic acrylic. It doesn't hold a lot of water, unlike the mop brush. And that is an advantage in some cases because the water runs out quickly and I can get these beautiful dry brush marks, which give a lot of texture and uh, character, especially when painting bits of architecture. They can imply a lot of detail without actually showing very much. And you can get some of these nice sparkles of light in the darker areas. An all natural brush would hold much more water and just would make these effects not impossible, but a little less easy to achieve. So 
So here, I just always think of like carving light. I'm just eliminating some of the light, but not killing it because it's a fairly light wash, it's warm, it's hopefully allowing some luminosity to read through. Uh, while that's really wet, I'm gonna drop in a little bit of imperial purple in these bits that I know are gonna wanna be a little darker doing it while it's wet so that I don't end up with too many hard edges, just nice and soft to make it look far away. And this violet and yellow ochre is a, obviously a complement, so you get a little bit of subtle electricity, not as much of bright orange and bright blue, but the yellow family and the violet family are beautiful complements. I sometimes use the edge of a flat brush to sort of imply a little detail and then it fades out and I love working in these areas where it's sort of a combination of wet and wet and wet on dry so you get a whole variety of edges that, uh, again, imply a lot of detail without really showing that much. It's always easier to, <laughs> to work less than more. It isn't, but it's uh, better to use fewer brush marks than more, that's for sure, almost every time. That's pretty good. Through my mind, I'm, I'm reminding myself of every brush stroke that this, this building belongs to not the distant background, but definitely the background. So to get there, I want to use a predominance of softer edges, some harder edges, but mostly soft, and a predominance of um, mid-tones, nothing uh, terribly dark. I want to play down the contrast. So even though I think I want to save some white here, that means the dark of the shadows I'm going to paint in wants to be a little less stark and a little less high contrast than probably the shadows I will paint up here. That contrast on the classic elements here should look different enough to what I do back here so that you really sense that three-dimensionality. All right, um, before all that dries, I'm gonna rough in some shadows on this, our big Victoria Emanuel wedding cake in the background. They call it the wedding cake or the typewriter building because if you see it, it quite literally looks like both of those things. I'm using a, um, a little bit of Mars yellow and the same violet under to just imply some reflected light up under. This happens everywhere, but especially in very, very warm climates on a very, very sunny day in Rome, you can see this effect happening everywhere. If you look up under arches or bridge overpasses, cornices, doorways. The shadowing, the shades are very rarely dark, gloomy, sad areas. They're uh, luminous. It's the sun hitting this white marble and illuminating the space under the, uh, the deep overhanging cornice. Do I have to do that? No, of course I don't, but I just love that effect. And even though this is far away, in a lower, less high contrast register, I really want that effect to be pretty obvious. Then as the shadow comes down and terminates, it gets a little darker, a little bit crisper, so dropping in a little bit of uh, brown in the violet. The overall effect looks good, but I don't like that. 
doesn't matter all that much, but I don't like it. So while this is still wet, I'll go back in, I think with a little yellow ochre, I think it'll be more appropriate. And drop some ochre into that just to get a little warm glow without being too Hollywood about it. And let that all just bleed together. Don't forget your finger, it's a great free brush. Yes, along with gravity, it's a free tool. It might seem I'm obsessing over this, but even though this is in the background, well, I guess I am obsessing over it a little, but even though it's in the background, it's a pretty prominent compositional element. So I wanna to try to nail it, both in terms of hinting at the architectural clarity and downplaying it enough so that it feels far away. And so far, I give myself pretty good marks. It looks, it looks pretty much the way I hoped it might. Um, not much else is needed, actually. I can hint at a few of these other shadows. I'm not looking at the reference photo because I don't want to get my head turned around and feel like I have to mimic what I see. At this point, I have the image of the reference photo, the information that it told me well enough in my mind that what I'm doing now is painting for the painting, not trying to copy the photo. So if it looks good in the painting, that's way more important than if it looks accurate to what was in any photograph. People are gonna look at your painting and assess. They're not necessarily gonna look at your reference material. So it's more important that it looks good in the paint, painting, even if it's wildly different from the photo. So overall, that's pretty good. It's uh, there, there's a, enough tightness, but I hope enough looseness that it looks appropriate to how I like to paint, but also to the subject at hand. And as this turns the corner, uh, yeah, I wanna add just a hint of detail over here, but really just a hint. I think I can do that most any time. There's this beautiful statue up top. Um, the sky behind needs to set enough so that it will hold a crisper edge and we're almost there, but not quite. Um, right. Probably the thing I need to do now is uh, lay in the trees, the greenery for the trees, so that they will fall down behind all these other elements. Um, I hesitated because I was thinking perhaps I should paint in uh, the Church of Santa Maria now because the trees are in part going to lay over it. But I'm not because that's another band of trees, I believe, so I think a separation will be fine. I'm thinking doing these mid-ground, almost background trees now because while the sky and building are a little wet, damp still, the trees can bleed into them a little bit. I don't know if they will because they're pretty set, but. Um, green pigment, I used to avoid it like the plague. I don't anymore, it's a long story involved. I used to always mix my own green pigments. I love the color green, but green pigment can look so either acidic or it can look dry, so dull and so flat. Uh, I use two Daniel Smith colors, a serpentine and a jadeite green. Neither of them dry flat or dull or gray at all. They have a lot of um, literal minerals in their composition, so they as they dry, these minerals sink and float to the surface and just end up with this gloriously animated uh, green pigments. This is a serpentine 
Danielle Smith. It's somewhat overall olive, mid-toned and olive in nature. I'm using this brush, which is a liner brush. Um, a lot of people make these. I bought this um, just at a vendor on the street in Italy. It has uh, long quills that stick out of the barrel, as you can see, and a fatter barrel that holds a good deal of water. Um, I'm not saying you need this to do brushes. It works for me often because you can hold it on its edge and just scrape it across this rough paper and you'll get these intuitive aerated marks that to me, for the way I paint, often uh, work really well. The last thing you wanna do is sit and draw your trees in and then paint each little leaf. Um, they just look so dry and disconnected from the painting. The quicker and more um, fluidly and really the less thinking you can do when you're drawing when you're painting trees the better i sketched in just the outline of the space i wanted the trees to inhabit but i didn't draw the actual trees i'm just allowing my brush to draw it um, As the trees come down into the space, they can become a little more solid. They'll pick up a little less light. So I'm gonna drop in some deeper tones at the bottom edges. I think a key to, I mean, this isn't much of a tree demonstration. It's they're pretty minimal. But I think it's worth mentioning that um, I think for what works for me. I paint the areas of tree foliage in first. Before they dry, I then scrape in um, some of the major trunks and branches and allow them to bleed into the wet foliage to connect. So they look organic and all connected and attached. I also think the success of greens greenery in your painting often depends, at least for me, most certainly on variety. By that I mean a variety of shapes, um, trying to avoid making your trees look too perfect often, and a variety of greens. So a base green is fine and then you modify it by dropping in um, warm tones, generally warm tones into the greens, adds a little bit of electricity. This is some burnt sienna while it's wet. And then because they're complements, they just, each color excites the other. They turns on the electricity and develops this really nice vibration. But you could, in larger areas of trees, grass, etc., you can modify um, your green zones with yellows, of course, if you want brighter greens, or blues and violets if you want really shady greens. Deep, deep red dropped into deep green will get you a neutral, but very close to black. Um, anyway, without becoming trans um, opaque and Dull. It'll still stay nice and transparent. This deeper green I'm using is uh, a Daniel Smith jadeite green. I'm starting to in introduce that down here lower as we get away from the sun. And I'm going to use less aeration, less, less of the sky showing through as we get down further into the painting and then as it gets further down and starts to meet up with the figures I've drawn and the edges of the statuary, I'm going to uh, reverse it from positive shape into negative shape painting. None of these kinds of techniques are hard to do. It's just uh, having a 
basic competence with them and then uh, knowing when they'll help you and when they won't. The, uh, the key here, the only tricky bit is to work as quickly as you can because this is setting up surprisingly quickly and I want I always want everything in my watercolors to look connected, if you know what I mean. Nothing looks like you walked away for six hours and came back and painted another tree and it looks pasted on the top or disconnected with the rest of the painting. I like all things to run together fluidly and all parts of my painting to look connected one to the other. So yes, here I'm negative shape painting where I'm describing the light areas with the darker areas. It's fine, but even that jadeite green, it's very beautiful, but it's looking a little too fresh. I want it to look more shadowy, so as it gets further down, I'm dropping in a little alizarin crimson here and there. I don't mix it in the palette. I try to... For the most part, I mix all of my colors on the surface of the paper, not in the palette first. If I mix these two colors together in the palette, of course, you would just end up with gray. And nothing wrong with gray, but um, if you want to keep it nice and lively, better to watch the magic of uh, color mixing right on the surface of the paper. So nothing wrong, I'm just not 100% thrilled with how the bottoms of these trees are connecting to the top. So before anything dries, I'm just adding some shapes, just trying to feather one area into the other. And uh, yeah, that's much better. Probably a little too much light showing through. All trees are not the same in this case these tree shapes overall I think want to be a little more graphic and not call too much attention to themselves so with the smaller flat brush I'm going to uh, drag some of these lower tones over eliminating some of the light bits in the middle Yes, that's much better. Not killing all the light, but just sort of reducing it here and there. Cool. As it gets down here, I want this deep green to be very graphic and then to pop out the light of the uh, marble statuary. So everything serves a purpose and I'm using it. I'm using these deep shades to help uh, tell the story. That's the other thing in your paintings. Uh, if it doesn't help advance your story, you shouldn't be afraid to just leave it out or change it, redesign it, move it, or eliminate it altogether. So here I'm using a jadeite green, dropping in a little bits of burnt sienna and even a lizarding crimson for the deep, duskier green that I'm negative shape painting in uh, around the horse's legs and the figure of Castor or his brother Pollock. I don't know which is which, if I'm honest. Yeah, as we meet up with the white marble, I want the green to be pretty darn dark. And I want to keep the bottom of this going so it doesn't uh, die on me. It's still pretty wet, so I should be able to connect up and then just finish off this bottom area. Negative shape painting around the figures walking up and down this large ramped stairway. The Cortonata.
this figure um, in large part is going to be part of this reverse L-shaped compositional My Darkest Darks. But I'm not altogether sure if I want her to be in all in darkness or have a little sparkle of light. Uh, that's not decided yet. So that is why I didn't paint over her. But I think it's fine. Yeah, pretty good. Um, right at the bottom, I think I could afford to go very dark and have that just feather itself visually into the darkest dark of the painting. So I'm dropping in some alizarin crimson against that deep, deep, deep green. And then you get this luminous, warm, cool, electric, neutral vibe there at the very bottom. Okay, so another thing, I want these sort of feathery edges and this, this intentional looseness of these trees to sort of dialogue with the uh, similar shapes and organic expression of the, the clouds that I painted a little earlier because they're kind of of the same clan. All of that juxtaposed to these hard-edged classical formal shapes. Uh, behind this character and this balustrade, there's a deep tree here, too, I want to include in front of the Santa Maria Church. There's some other trees I could leave out. In reality, they climb all the way up here. And I'm sort of rethinking them. I may redesign them a bit, so I'm not worried about them just yet. While I was doing all this, this is dried enough that I can go back now and drop in, probably just with dry brush, a few quick marks to imply some uh, architectural detailing there. Doesn't need a lot, but just a little. Again, it's far away and I want it to look far away. but I want the clarity of the architecture, even faintly, wants to be there. However, the last thing you want to do is overdo it, again, because it's so far away and you want it to stay that way. So a little bit of um, yellow ochre, little dots of uh, violet dropped in just to imply some detail. Discretion is really key there. I mean, I love to draw and I love these kinds of subjects. I could see myself in another kind of drawing just spending a day just drawing all this crazy architectural detail as perfectly as I can manage it. But I also know that for this, in this case, that is not going to end up with a better painting. Reeling all that in and keeping it simpler and more schematic is really the way to go. This is some raw umber, which is very much like yellow ochre, but a little darker, probably a little too dark. It's not horrible, but a little too dark. Soften it a bit. Then, um, these are very deep set, so they will have some shadows, which you want to go dark, but Again, because this is far away, not too dark. So this is just a um, median wash of uh, violet, although it looks like some green got mixed into it. So it's a little bit gray, but 
Yeah. It's okay. Gosh, it's been raining here like crazy. I guess it's good. But I'm going a little stir crazy. Yeah, I'm gonna have to wipe the uh, green out of my palette soon because it's polluting everything. Okay, um, now I will paint in uh, the face of Santa Maria. It's a dark red church. Again, if I really wanted to, I could redesign it and change it, but I don't want to. I think the red is actually beneficial as it's nice and warm. And I think, again, the man-made elements, I want all in warm tonalities and the natural elements in cool. So the fact that it's uh, a deep red brick actually is fortunate. Yeah, this pesky green, I'm gonna eliminate for now. I'll be back to it in a minute. So for this, um, there's no specific color that seems quite right. So I am going to mix a tone in my palette. Just going to tone out some burnt sienna, adding a little bit of a a little bit of alizarin crimson and then even some uh, raw umber in it, but it's fine. It doesn't have to be exact, but I like this kind of deep earthy tonality to the actual church, and I feel like trying to, uh, relatively speaking, get there. Some violet. Also, for the entire composition, tonally, this, this element, even though it's in sun, because it's this deep, dark brick, needs to be dark to help compositionally uh, flesh out the rest of my composition. So that's another reason I want to be fairly accurate to this uh, dark brick. So there's just a streak of uh, burnt umber. This is some French Ultra mixed in with the violet. And yeah, overall, I think that's about right. Just a nice, fairly dark, earthy tone, tonality overall. Keeping it very much in these earth tones. And not deep jet black dark, but overall relatively dark. Again, a big tree falls down here, so I can just feather the bottom of this out. Not stress about it. And even a few sparkles of light in there uh, are not bad. There's a, a beautiful ornamental door frame, which I could have saved out as light, but I just chose not to because I don't think, I don't think it's going to add that much. While I'm at it, I'm going to do a wash over the whole foreground because this is going to be dark. 
and I want it to tie in to this L-shaped composition. So similarly to the way I did the sky, I'm going to paint the bases of the uh, this balustrade and the statue bases with uh, clear water. The only reason is because I don't want a hard edge. And uh, this way, when I start to add pigment, it'll bleed into that but make a soft edge rather than a hard edge. And that'll help me preserve the light and help get this ho hopefully poetic transition from lightness into darkness. Definitely need light here. Gotta be careful there. The green is probably still quite wet. Again, so that's just clear water. I'll go to a fairly, one of the, on the larger end of these mop brushes. First, this is some Mars yellow. I don't mind if a bit of it goes up into the uh, statuary because these are gonna be toned sides and they'll have similar pigmentation on them when I get there. And also, even pure white doesn't have to be uh, untouched white paper. It can have faint warms and cools in it to en enliven it. Definitely want that to bleed up into the building. Again, a tree will be there, not a big deal, but I don't want to take any chances. Yeah, overall, I'm liking that. It's starting to look like this transition from light down into darkness. In fact, I'm gonna play that up while that's still a bit wet by starting some of the shadow work shade work on the sides of um, our big statuary bases here. So these crisp shade lines can bleed down organically into the, uh, the fluid shadow and shades that I'm building along the bottom. I have to do this relatively quick, but I've got a nice wet bead down there. And as long as that stays, I'm good. that effect. It's another thing watercolor can do so beautifully. It has this way of allowing one thing to just become another thing just by the modulation of edges and uh, one thing can just grow organically into another. Cool. Okay now before this dries I'm gonna tone out the bottom of the page. This is a pretty wet wash of uh, burnt sienna. I can go over this figure because I'm pretty sure he's going to be very dark tonally. I can work some of that warm up into here. Save a little glint of light there for sure. And then this violet at the bottom. So I don't know if you watched my um, video on basics, but I did wash types and that was just a big um, graded wash. Looks like I splattered water up into my church face, but that's one of those cases where you just say, ah, oh, I meant to do that. So we're not done, obviously, but at this stage of the painting, you can begin to see pretty clearly 
the design of all the um, visual design components and the value design all beginning to take shape and to fall into place. The light, the light, 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 the dark encompassing it all, a little bit of dark here, the dark that's coming here that's even going to be darker but still it's taking shape and then the mid-tones here and here primarily and this will be somewhat in mid-tones and a bit of darks. So yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, I don't know what happened there. I must have splattered water, but I don't really mind that. Obviously, it's a very old church, and it gives it a little bit of uh, unexpected sparkle. So, yes, some mistakes aren't bad at all. I can live with that. Trying to finish a painting all in one sitting is almost always my goal, which is fine. However, it means that uh, you can only paint, you know, one area at a time, and then uh, while you're doing that, other areas of the painting are, are drying, and that can be bad or good, so you have to plan ahead a bit and stage the painting so you don't do anything too soon. Uh, because this is so wet, I'm afraid to turn the board this way or that. So I want to paint in the statuary in the distance, but that may happen later. I definitely want to paint in these trees, but this is too wet just yet because I need to hold this edge fairly crisp. So I can't do that just yet. Um, I can start here on some of the uh, shadows I know I'm going to have on the statuary because it's dry into nearly dry there, so I should be good. I wanna do a lot of these very warm shadows on the uh, marble statues. So to that end, this is a bit of a Daniel Smith permanent orange. It's, uh, can be a fairly intense color. I'm not sure it's the way I want to go, but I may just use a little of its flavor and mix it in with some yellow ochre. Yeah, I like that. So I want to be relatively rendering-like and a little bit crisper and cleaner here. So it's not exactly orange, but it's definitely uh, warm. Um, and then with a fairly small moppish brush, I want to, um, not sure how much of this I need to do, but here and there I want to drop in a little bit of violet, just to leaven that uh, brighter orange. nice. So what I'm trying to do here is just um, paint warm shadows, which are luminous shadows just filled with bounced and uh, reflected light. Uh, I freely admit I'm obsessed with shadows. And it really is because in watercolor you you don't paint the light, you just reveal it. All we do is we paint the shadows. So um, as much life and luminosity as you can work into your areas of shadow, it's at least worth thinking about before you just reach for that tube of Payne's gray or 
indigo or whatever people use, just think about the fact that a lot of shadows are not that dull and gray. They're pretty luminous. It is true I can overdo it at times, but I love them. Yeah, a few years ago, I, I looked back and I saw um, I used a lot of extremely orange pigments and sh um, tonality in some of my shadows, and it was, uh, well, it worked occasionally, but it was also a little over the top. So here, uh, it's violet and this yellow ochre with just a, just a drop of orange in it. And it's a, a nice, warm, cool toggle. And just simplifying it. This area needs to be pretty light, so I want to keep it minimal and not eat away too much more of the actual light there. So I think we're in good shape. I'm going to just leave it, call it good, try to be happy with it. Now I want to come over here and do something quite similar. Although that said, I'm not 100% sure what I've even drawn. But again, it's just this uh, hopefully fairly organic toggle between warm and cool. Trying not to be overly literal about things, but um, I just want that electricity. Using a small eighth inch, really cheapy um, flat brush for some of the shadowing. Again, it allows, because it doesn't hold a lot of water, it allows the uh, pigment to run out quite quickly and then I have the opportunity for these very characterful dry brush marks that I am a little bit addicted to. In truth to tell, a better brush that hold, held more water would not allow me to do those effects quite as simply. Again, same story over here. Um, these are light and need to remain light, but some of this pure saved white is going to be critical for me to tell my little story, so I have to uh, be a a bit judicious on how much of the light I want to eat away. Again, you can always go back and take it away, but it's pretty difficult to add it once it's gone. So I think I'm just gonna call it quits on that for now and say that's pretty good. People ask me if I ever go back and tweak a painting once it's done. And of course, I'm always tempted to say, oh no, I would never do that. But that would be a lie because of course I do. But I would say, I don't think anything is wrong, but it's just uh, often so easy to overwork a painting and it's so fun to paint. This is my problem that even especially almost when a painting is going well, I have a hard time just putting my brushes down and saying, all right, leave it alone, it's done. I just want to keep fiddling with it. And it takes an instant for a pretty good painting to tip over into the pretty bad territory. So almost always better advice to stop while you're ahead before you're done completely, rather than pushing ahead and ruining it. Okay, um, I wanna add the statue here now. This bottom wash is not dry, but it's dry enough. It 
It's incredible bronze statuary on the top of uh, the Vittoria Emanuel monument. Again, I'm a little bit tempted to paint it uh, maniacally and accurately, but I also know that would be a very, very bad mistake. So I'm gonna try to be discreet and just play it down. As for color, um, I do want it to be greenish. I think it'll be a nice dialogue so the greenery doesn't look so isolated. Mm. Use some cobalt teal, I think, and I'll modify it with a little bit of um, violet. That should do. So again, it's far away and it's definitely not the star of the show. It's kind of graphically interesting and somewhat important, but you don't want it to dominate. So I'm just gonna try to be fairly schematic about it. More detail is almost never the answer to make your paintings look more finished or better. Viewers like to, con if they like your painting, it's often because they feel some connection to it, which is what you want. So if you don't show them every little thing, leave something to their imagination. It's the subtle, ingenious way that the painter has of um, setting up this dialogue between painter and the audience, the viewer. Um, I love paintings like that when I look at art shows or museums or in art books or online where I have to look at it and the painting is almost a little bit of a quiz where the artist is asking me to, uh, to get involved, to figure it out, to tell my own stories, ask my own questions. All paintings are not alike, I get it, and it's true, they're not. But sometimes when you leave a good bit to the viewer's imagination, um, the net result can be more effective than if you absolutely show every detail and spell out every little thing. So I think that's enough. It's green enough, again, that it sets up a dialogue with the greenery down below, but hopefully it's not too dark. I don't think so. I think it'll be all right. I'm a little concerned it's a bit dark, but I think I think it won't be when it all dries. I can leaven it a bit with a paper towel and just soften it, but I think I just won't worry about it. I think it'll be fine. It uh, veers toward the blue and blue or warm, but especially blue and violet are another signifier color, making things look farther away. If you think about standing in the landscape, looking out, things in the distance often tend to look a little bit blue, blue-ish. That's not a hard and fast rule, and it's not always the case, but it, it is often sort of a, a kind of a hack that painters can use to make something look far away. Less saturation, less value, and more bluer in tonality will often just help you along the way. So here in the distance, behind the Santa Maria, there are some trees. Again, I have the freedom to leave them out, but I do want to bring them up. I want to engage this building and even cover it up a little bit. But I want them to be a little more graphic and not um, as feathery as this, I think. I'm devising a little mini plan for these trees. We'll see. So I think I'm going to sketch in some of those columnar cypress trees that you often see in Italy and elsewhere. 
which are a little more architectural because they're columnar in shape. And I think it'll be just a subtle little way to engage the architecture and finish off this band of green. And if I do it with the small flat brush, just a couple of dry brush marks should be enough to get me there and I don't have to do much more than that. Um, as these come down a little further into the composition, they can get a little bit more green and start to mimic that value. And definitely behind the statues, they must So this again is jadeite green. Um, I'm modifying it with a little bit of deep red so it gets dusky and dark, but still green and still luminous, but not as fresh as it would be if it was in direct sun. And it doesn't matter realistically. What matters is, am I delivering a value that helps my painting? And for these white marble statues to sing out, they need a dark value around them, sandwiching them. So yes, this guy in particular. Um, right, all right, this church face doesn't need much. It needs a little bit of love. I can do that with a couple of dry brush marks, I'm pretty sure. There's a very deep inset window here. That's just some raw umber. Another small one up there. Some sort of banding there, I think, if I remember. You might have noticed from the reference photo, which I'll find again before we're done, um, I made a few architectural changes. And you know, who am I not to uh, <laughs> redesign Michelangelo? But I did raise the base of the statuary up a bit to emphasize my vertical composition. And I did raise uh, Santa Maria, the church, up a little so that it goes off the page rather than cuts off here to help contain the composition. So I hope none of the ancient geniuses will come back to punish me, but it was for a good cause. Beautiful Romanesque half-domed archway over the door. I hope you can see I'm trying to be schematic, not inaccurate so much as just not overly detailed. I don't want anything here to take away from this, so I'm being, uh, again, fairly schematic about my treatment of all those shapes. This is, these shadows are falling against a deep, um, obviously this deep red terracotta wall. So they're not gonna be, shadows are not gonna be as luminous as they are here on the white Carrera marble. But again, I have the right to change that if I really wanted, but I don't see the need to. Anyway, I think that's all that's needed. Uh, it's a very simplistic facade in reality, and I want to keep it that way. This curves up and adds a little shadowing. I don't know how important that is to me, but I guess I could give a nod to it. Just this mid-sized flat brush, and I'll feather it out. 
add a little, if nothing else, a little texture. Cool. Um, all right, that needs to set a bit, and I'll add the last bit of greenery, which is a grouping of shrubs and low trees just behind uh, the balustrade here. I want this window to set up a little, but while that's happening, I guess in this case, I can start at the bottom by adding uh, the lower portion of the trees that you might see through the balustrade. and what you might see over the top. And I think by the time I get this roughed in, uh, this will be dry enough to be able to handle anything I do on top of it. Again, it's a container for value. It needs to be pretty dark to get this guy to pop out properly. small little brush just to do the negative painting around the figure then I can go back to a slightly larger half inch flat just to lay in some quick value some jadeite green really getting into some dusky colors over here uh, a little too dusky but that's okay um, find my uh, liner brush and then um, the tops of this tree are closer than these so they can be a little bit fresher a little bit more sun might hit them And then as it comes down into the composition, quickly resolve into the shadows. So again, for that, because that's still wet, I can just, um, it's not opaque obviously, but some fairly opaque-ish jadeite green, just drop it in and let it run around. It'll add some tonality and shade, but hopefully maintain the little bit of the shadowy luminosity that's already there. I didn't design in any trunks or branches, but that just sort of developed on its own and I decided to take advantage of it and make a little moment there. And again, and that should do it. The only other thing is uh, the lower portion of this comes across and I do want to clarify that just ever so slightly. So to get these effects, you need very little water in the brush. It's not totally dry, but it's the equivalent of dry brush, I guess. And just push or abuse the brush across the surface and you can get those nice aerated uh, shapes that just look careless, but if you're lucky, they look elegant and tree-like. I'm not always that lucky. I think I was somewhere in the middle today. They look okay.
but sometimes they look genuinely awful, so. Okay. Um, at this stage, the painting is not exactly on the last round, but it's getting close. Now we can start thinking about the darkest darks and then the details on the statuary, and then it, it actually will be done. I'm obsessing ever so slightly on what happened up there. It's not a big deal because it's far away and I should leave it alone, but I won't. It's fine, but I'm starting to develop a little bit too much value in that distant building and um, it'll be all right. But I think to learn my lesson and leave it alone. Um, the dark figures and the bleeding into the shadow is somewhat the last thing to go. Um, detailing on the Castor and Pollock statues has to happen, but could happen at the very end if I want, or it could happen now while this is drying. So I think uh, this demonstration is running on a bit long, so. I will do at least one of them and maybe move on down here and then uh, do the rest off camera. I have drawn these statues. Uh, if anything, I've overdrawn them. So the pencil mark showing through is another thing that drives some people crazy about watercolors. They don't want to see any pencil marks. I'm not of that school at all. I, for me, the pencil marks, the drawing are all part of my process. So not only do I not mind seeing them, I want to see them. But again, there are different ways of painting and different aesthetics and they may not suit you. I, again, don't mind them. In fact, to the contrary, I love them. So I'm not, uh, I'm not affected by the desire to erase all of my pencil marks. Once, um, to a degree, once your pencil marks get wet with a wash or a glaze or whatever you're doing, they'll be much harder to get off, if not impossible, so. So what I'm using here is just uh, similar to what I did here, yellow ochre with little bits of violet. I'm gonna drop in for some of the shadow areas. I want these horses and the human figures to, I think why I'm emphasizing the drawing is because I want the drawing element to sort of be the most formal and descriptive and the watercolor bits to be um, just more suggestive and loose. Hopefully the combination of the two will make a nice, uh, create a nice narrative. Probably safe to say less is more in this case. I don't need a lot going on. I'm softening up with clear water some of these harder edges, not all, but just some here and there. And just try to lightly um, describe the architecture of the figure and the horse.
looks a little bit more like a carousel pony, but hmm. that'll do. The top of the figure got a little bit of blue early on when I was doing the uh, sky, when I misted that, it wet the top of his head, so that's not as crisp white right there as I would like. Hardly tragic, but what I could do if it bothers me is I could uh, mask and wash that off later. I could scrape it out, although I tend not to do that. I don't like to damage the paper that way, although it can be done. Or I could hit it with a little white paint. Um, I think I'd prefer to mask it and just sort of lift off some of that blue when this is all 100% done and dry. Or I could just decide it doesn't really bother me. It's not that big of a deal. I guess those are the options. Knowing me, I think it will bother me a little, so I will probably lift it off. Um, the figure is more in sun for the most part. However, as he turns to the right, this could get a little bit of ochre. And as the figure goes down away from the sun, it'll pick up glints of pure sun, but it'll get a little bit less than the top of the figure overall. So I'm adding additional um, ochre as the figure moves down into the page. To the right, there'll be a shadow from the horse onto the, the standing human figure. So there could be a shadow there. But what I'm trying to do is paint these all together connected so I don't see a really stark differentiation between figure and man, between horse and rider. Not too bad. A little bit of muddled value here, so I think I'll darken his shoulder rather than lighten to get it to pop out in that value family against the sky. Yep, that's better. Again, you can always add value, you can always add marks. It's harder to take them away, but I just don't want to overdo it. I want to keep it fairly fresh if I can and really allow the, the pencil work to, to carry the day. What you can really see here, though, is the dialogue between the architecture of this neoclassic building and the, the more Renaissance architecture here and you want this to feel more forward. So to that end, I'm going to drop in a little additional value to help pull these up and push that back, which is why I didn't want to go dark at all on that guy, so I wouldn't have to do too much of this value manipulation at this stage. But it's okay, it's all working.
because I did so much negative painting with the dark trees behind on the other figure and horse, and because he's slightly further away, Somewhat less consideration needs to be given to this, mostly because I need to preserve more pure white of the paper than I did for this figure. So less shadowing, less tonality, definitely less violet, maybe none at all, but almost just a little bit of the ochre. Really um, being mindful of keeping as much of the white of the paper here is that humanly possible. And a more schematic treatment of any shadowing. Less specific, that is to say, less more general and less of it. I think for that stage, that's good enough. Main task on this is to save as much light as possible. Right. Um, the very dark figures in the foreground. Or one last thing to go. The sun is coming this way. Again, this figure I saved out, so I think I will paint her half in light with a shadow coming down across undefined from where, but still, I think the top of her figure in light will be interesting and her friend there uh, all in shadow. I think that'll be a nice little sub dialogue I can play around with. tell these little shadows needed to be beefed up. This all has to read as part of the dark foreground. Uh, he will be in shadow. He will. Um, he will definitely, although the top won't be as dark as the base. This couple really not in deep shadow. So I think I will paint them next, and I have to decide what to do with these. These two figures I saved out as pure white, just because I wanted, wanted to, but I don't want them to be pure white in the final analysis, because they would, by rights, should be and would be in shadow. So I'm just gonna paint over them simply with some ochre, just to tone them down. So they'll still be there, but not quite so screaming out for so much attention. Gosh, calm down. I think that's okay. Um, doesn't really matter. Again, these guys can have a little um, color perhaps on them. I like the simple color palette of this painting. I, I don't want to veer into any sort of bright pigmentations and um, very descriptive or architectural colorations. I think that's really not going to be the way to go. So to that end, I'm not sure what I think the best idea would be. This woman is wearing a a longish coat. I think because she's in the sun, I'm going to give it a brighter blue. This will help sort of pick up this blue in the sky, I hope. 
and also vibrate off the ochres and oranges of the, uh, the statuary behind. And hopefully when it's all done, we'll make a certain kind of sense. She's just been down at the Corso shopping. Something I know all too much about. This is some um, deep brown burnt umber I'm dropping into the lower portion of her body. The brown-blue combo is something I can really do love. Adds a little bit of uh, warm warmth, but also some shadowy tonality that vibrates nicely off the blue. It's pretty good. This is a manganese blue. I think uh, the very her top shoulder, which will be more in sun. Just a little hint of color there, additional color. Her friend here, I don't know. I think I'll make him more in warm tones like the statuary behind, but a little more saturated. So just some ochres, perhaps a little Mars yellow. And then the same tonal to colors brown the um, burnt umber or the lower portion of his body. He's actually down a step so he's not that much shorter, but I want to imply that he's on a lower level than she. Uh, before she dries, I will indicate there's a slight indention in the pavement, which is not architecturally that significant for this painting, but I think the directionality of this line will be helpful. And also, I can just drag it into a suggestion of a shadow. Okay, this guy will be largely in shade, but I don't want him to be, as I said, as dark as the trees behind, so. It isn't, there's no pure white here to save, but I think I'll save out some lighter bits of the toned paper, put him into some um, warmer toned jacket just to vibrate subtly off the greenery in front of which he's standing. So this is just burnt sienna. It's always tricky to not to detail your figures properly. And by that I mean to the degree that the painting wants. A really loose plein air sketch painting generally does not want figures to look too specific, too rendered or detailed. A very formal painting you can get away with more detail in the figures, but it's, I don't know, it's a dance. It's not always the right thing to do. 
if you put too much color, too much detail, too much emphasis on them, they can very quickly start to dominate the painting and take over. And unless they happen to be the subject matter, they can look really out of place or as if they've wandered in from some other painting. So it's this sort of balancing act between detailing them sufficiently if they help and not detailing them if they don't. Or often the answer is somewhere in the middle. Darker, darker shadow will come soon when I and I hope he will have this, this subtle sparkle for lack of a better term of the warmth of his jacket against the deeper cool of the shadow that's coming and then he'll just dissolve into that the way these trees dissolved and the way these bases dissolved. Over here we're more in stark backlit territory. So the balustrade and the figure standing against it can be a little bit specific because they're going to have quite bright sun behind and they'll look a little bit more etched against the bright sunlight behind. So a crisper edge here makes sense. Color here is not wrong, but not necessarily all that important. It's a value, so I'm using um, deep raw umber, darker warm value. And uh, if you don't want a darker shape like this to look too relentless, you can sometimes drop in a little tone just to enliven it while it's still wet. So it won't look specific, it'll just look like a general tone. So this is just a little cobalt blue I'll drop into the body of the figure to cool it down, but to perhaps imply some general, not terribly specific color. I'll need to be a little bit um, specific on these classical balustrades. But here again, just like drawing figures, it's a balance. You want a little sense of specificity and detail, but you can very quickly start to overdo it and they can look cartoony and overworked and demand too much attention. So I think if they're drawn fairly well, you can paint them pretty loosely. And um, if you're lucky, they should look pretty good. Keeping emphasis, I think, in this case on value and not color will help. Just keep them dark, whatever shape, um, tone they need to be, dark in this case, and not terribly specific is the way to go, in my opinion. So you can see I'm not being utterly descriptive and that's, that's on purpose so that they look a little bit more free and not whimsical, but not uh, constipated and overly detailed. But they're there, but not too there. They're not really the subject, but you do need that texture and flavor, I think, to make this whole painting make sense. This figure, I want quite dark in the shadows. He wants to belong to the shadows this is neutral tint, straight out of the tube. It's not black, 
It's a deep violet gray, which you can drop into other colors to darken them, but by itself can look pretty, uh, it's beautifully dark. It's not necessarily a beautiful color, but it gets the job done quite quickly. I'm trying to get all these dark tones to hang together a little better. They are, sort of. But I gotta paint fast because all these loose, wet shapes have to uh, tie together. I am thinking of some general color, I guess. I'll use blue again for this figure, drop it into this deep ultra or uh, neutral tint base. I'm having a hard time seeing what I drew, but I have a little faith it'll look okay. A little faith is a good thing. I wouldn't call it confidence as much as just faith. I've done it enough times that I'm hoping uh, muscle memory will pull me through. Figures in watercolor, I, I will talk probably a lesson later on them, but these are a little specific, but in general, if you can get sort of the architecture of the top of the body, a reasonable head, neck, shoulders, the rest of the body can be pretty general and just sort of hang off of that. So this woman, I do, as I said, I wanted her to be part and son, and I think it's a good choice because I think she'll set up this triad of dialogue with the the inanimate sculptures, and uh, it'll be another little, uh, little narrative and contrast built in. So, but to that end, I want to put very little paint on her, and I'm using the same, for, to begin at least, the same tonalities, the ochres, and a little bit of violet perhaps. So she'll look um, related to Castor and Pollock there. As we're coming down, I'm moving into some uh, burnt siennas. Then again, I want to cast a shadow, I guess, from this figure across her body. I will start it as fairly dark-ish violet. And the small flat brush just Scrape in the rest of the figure. And yeah, I think overall that was a pretty good choice um, just to help finish off the narrative of this painting. A little fancy, I don't know if I need to do that, but I'll take a little bit of cad red light see if this is a mistake, drop it into this shadow. What I'm hoping was it'll enliven her. She's kind of the star figure of the show, but the red against this green and the blue, I think will be a nice color um, electric gilt. tiny bit of warmth on the back of her uh, 
hair. All right, uh, okay, so far, one larger connecting wash is needed. I see a few of the things I'd like to do, but I may do them off camera, but I'll do one now. This is just a shadow from the human figure against the horse. I think I can afford to lose a little bit more white up here. I definitely think I need some more uh, depth to the sculptures, especially here. They could be more in line with, not as dark as these figures, but in the shadow areas, they could be approaching that depth of value because they're kind of focal and they're much closer. should be doing the dark shadow along the bottom of the page now so that it can bleed and blend up with the uh, figures. But I was just obsessed about doing this, so there you go. Yeah, but I can see I want to do a little bit more of this kind of work. I think it'll be uh, appropriate and look better. I'm still keeping the shadows here in the warm family because they're inanimate. But I think if I'm going to be using this deeper reddish brown, I could drop in some cobalt blue, which will be a nice electrical complement. Yeah, I think that's probably about enough. Maybe a bit more on this guy. Um, as his face turns away from the sun. This is cobalt blue I'm using now. Still trying to be cautious to not overdo it. It doesn't need a lot. And again, I love to paint, which is great, but it's hard for me to put down my brush sometimes and say, all right, you're done, that's enough. It's hard for me to do that. I need a connecting wash over the bottom of the painting. These figures aren't bad, but they look a bit like they're floating and I want to connect them to the rest of the painting. <clears throat> and also I need to establish more clearly the dark framing element of the foreground. So to get there, I will go to my mid-size mop brush. This is clear water. I don't want to disturb any of the painting I did on the figure, so if I scrape over it with a brush, it may tend to smear them a bit because they're not that dry. So I'm gonna mist instead. This is a good way to add water without disturbing too much of what's underneath. These figures were the last to be painted, so they're melting a little bit. That's good, I don't mind that at all. I want them to melt a little so that they connect. What I'm using, the first pigment will be a Mars yellow. Just wanna save that little bit of light and then some luminosity. Then a bit of burnt sienna, 
Yeah. Now for the very bottom, I'm gonna mix a little bit of a French Ultra into the violet, just a little more color identity, not just so neutral. Fine, but I think I could come up with this deep, and I think that red wants to be a little more insistent, so this is some Holbein light red. Not an orange, but a deeper earthy red. color. And a bit more of the uh, violet ultra blue at the bottom. Here, um, this is a bit of a convention in a lot of watercolors, this idea of reflections. Uh, Obviously, I don't hate it, or I wouldn't be doing it, but I would say it can be overdone and um, should watch it. But because this is a marble piazza, I think it's not inappropriate. There could be, even on a dry, sunny day, there could be little bits of uh, reflectivity, and it's just a really easy and effective way to connect elements of your painting. But again, it's a little bit of a gimmick that can be overdone. So generally I like that. There's this warm glow you get from the sunny piazza, but then it dissolves into this beautiful translucent cool shadow at the bottom. It starts to establish the reverse L-shaped of my dark shape for the composition. This guy wants to be a little darker, I can tell, because he's part of this overall shape. My lights are, I think, appropriately placed from here through here, around here, up through the sky and out, so it connects all parts of the painting. Um, the darks, that hug them, I think are appropriately placed here in the cool, here in the warm, dissolving into the cool. I like the arrangement of darks. The mid-tones then flesh out the rest of the painting, primarily the sky and the building tones. Most of your paintings are gonna be dominantly mid-toned. The bright lights will be generally, um, arguably the most important, but quanti quantifiably less area than your uh, mid-tones, similarly to the darks. Very critical, but depending on the mood of your painting, they'll probably take up less space than all of the mid-tones. But again, that's not a rule, it just sort of happens that way and uh, generally looks a little more balanced. Um, but there you go, guys. I think, uh, thank you everyone for watching. I'm not 100% done. There's some little tweaks I wanna make, but I think uh, they're minor. The big elements are there and I hope you found this helpful, uh, enjoyable, and instructive it was fun to do and happy painting and i'll see you all soon thank you